Hi everyone, this is a Beacon Spotlight video. My name is Bobby and I'm a developer. Here at Beacon, we usually spend our time analyzing financial data and building analytical models and technical solutions for our clients. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected the world on such a scale and with such speed that it is difficult to comprehend. All of us at Beacon feel a profound sense of community and solidarity with those affected by the virus and support for those on the front lines fighting against it. As we view websites and news articles for COVID-19 updates, we often think to ourselves, we wish we could view the data slightly differently or apply our own assumptions to a projection. There is a power in the ability to take charge of an analysis, to engage with the data and put together mathematical models which can help us understand what is happening and what might follow, even if we are not experts in this field and especially if we find ourselves focusing only on the most extreme headlines and dire predictions. In the following video, we will explain how to use Beacon to analyze publicly available COVID-19 data. I'll be using the same tool set that all Beacon customers have access to. Let's get started with collecting some data. The ECDC website makes their data available daily in CSV format. Let's go to the Beacon IDE. This is where Beacon developers and our clients add to the code base. Here I've created a script which will download the data. Once I've downloaded the data, I will load the data into a pandas data frame. Then I'll upload the data into a Postgres database. And finally, I'll also load the data into Beacon time series objects which are stored in our object database. Once the script is written and ready, I want to make use of the Beacon job scheduler to run the script each day. The job scheduler is a powerful tool to run jobs on any schedule or based on a set of dependencies. To do this, I will have to create a job file. The job file will call the script and run it each day. If we want, we can take a look at the job scheduler dashboard in Beacon and see the job and whether it's been run. If I search for COVID, I can see my job, and I'll notice that the state is done, meaning that it's run successfully. I can also take a look at the logs of this job and see all the different countries that have been downloaded. And if I scroll to the bottom, I can see that there are no errors. Next, let's check to make sure that the data has been saved into our object database. Back in the IDE, let's open up Beacon Browser, which we can do in the shell by typing BB. This will launch an application which is a window into our Mongo object database. From here, I can navigate into container ext, COVID data, ECDC, and I can see the daily data files that have been saved each day, with the latest being in daily, daily data latest. Let's go to superset and see the data which has been uploaded into Postgres. We can do this by going back to the IDE and opening up the home page. Beacon is entirely cloud-based, and here we can see all the services that are available. From the home page, we can open up our analytics service. Our analytics service is linked to Superset. Here we can see that someone has already created a coronavirus dashboard, so let's take a look at it. Here are a variety of different charts that have been populated with the coronavirus data that we've already downloaded and loaded into Postgres. If you want to, you can go to the SQL editor and play with the data directly by running SQL queries. If you want to further explore the data, you can click on the Explore tab and create custom graphs from the data generated by your query. I've created a few already, this one is plotting the total cases each day for several countries. A slightly different version is showing the total stacked on top of one another. SQL and Superset are very useful tools for analysis, but we also persisted the data into Beacon's time series objects. So let's go back to the IDE and open up our applications page. First, let's close some of these tabs down since we don't need them. From the IDE, let's open up our Applications page.
Beacon has a host of applications that we can run. We're going to run one called Plot Tool. Time series are a fundamental building block of Beacon, and data which is persisted in this form can be exposed via our Plot Tool application. After the Plot Tool application is launched, we can see that I've already created a tab which is plotting a few series through time. We're looking at the new cases of several different countries through time. Another tab that I've created is showing a similar view of the US new cases, but on top of that, I've added a rolling mean with a window of seven days to show how we can smooth the daily series. And additionally, I've added a volatility series to kind of give us a gauge of how, ver how much variation there is around reporting these coronavirus cases. Looking at the existing data is useful and informative, but projecting forward based on some assumptions and a model is the next step in our analysis. Beacon makes Jupyter Notebooks available for creating and sharing ideas. Let's go back to the Applications page and open up Jupyter. I've already created a simple model in my shared space, so let's open that up. This notebook is a sketch of a simple model for projecting the coronavirus forward through time. The model is called an SIR model, and it captures the percent of the population which is susceptible, the percent infected, and the percent removed. Let's go ahead and run it, and we can see that we're creating several steps forward through time. I'm also able to plot the model forward through time and display the projections in the notebook. An important point is that this notebook is in a shared folder so that I can easily ask colleagues for feedback or to contribute. Once we have a useful sketch of a model built in Jupyter, we can code it up and check it into source code control. Back in the IDE, we can see that I've created a class called Epidemic Simulation. The class contains the forward projection model and the historical time series data. We can check the code in and make modifications using the source code control framework that's built into the IDE. Here we can see the changes that I've made recently. Sophisticated controls could eventually be put into place to ensure that this code can't be modified without a code review and approval from other developers. Now that we have a Python class defined, we can access the functionality in other applications via RPC. If I were to create a function which interacts with the functionality with, that we just created, we could call it in Excel via the Beacon Excel add-in. Let's take a look here where I've defined a function called time series, which takes in a location, a series type, a start date, and an end date. Let's open up Excel and see this in action. Here we can see that I'm making a call into the time series function that I just showed you, and I'm passing in four references, location, series, start date, and end date. When I execute this, what happens is, is that the message is sent to the Beacon backend, and then Beacon returns the response into the Excel. If I change the input, I'll get a different series. Calling Beacon from RPC or the Excel add-in is a great way to expose our models and data to a user, but we can also make use of the Beacon UI framework to do this natively within Beacon. Taking the functionality that has already been coded up and adding a UI layer around it is usually a task left to UI experts. But with Beacon's UI framework, known as Glint, developers can write totally in Python and make use of a variety of features and widgets to develop some sophisticated applications. You can also launch the applications directly from the IDE, which saves time not having to build or compile anything to test changes to your application. So let's take a look at a Glint application that I've created and launch it from the shell. Inside of our application, we have the ability to pick the location. We also have the ability to choose between three different views. Taking a look at the historical view, we can see this is pretty much like the plot tool application that we've seen before. One thing we can do is we could put the total cases on the same axis. We could also change it to plot them on different axes. If we want, we could also change the dates And the last thing that we can do on this page is see the data frame 
of all the data that backs up these charts. A slightly more interesting view is our country compare view. Here we can choose which countries we'd like to compare and we can set a threshold for the starting point of each series. For example, setting this to 500 total cases means that the charts for each country begin when their total cases are greater than 500. This allows us to compare each country from a common starting point. So let's add the countries we'd like to see. Let's pick Italy, Germany, Spain, South Korea. And let's chart the total cases for each of these countries. So it's pretty interesting to see the rate of progression between all of these different countries through time with a common starting point. We could also take a look instead of the total cases, we could see the new cases per day for a slightly different comparison. This is a fairly interesting view of the data that may not be available on most websites. The last view that I want to show you is the scenario view. This is a UI layer around the Jupyter Notebook model that I sketched up and then coded in the IDE. Here we can actually play with some of the dials to the model. I have R0, which is the number of people that one infected person is expected to infect. I have the recovery time after infection. I also have the percent asymptomatic, which is the percent of the population who shows no symptoms even though they test positive for the coronavirus. Estimates vary wildly, but some are as high as 50%. Percent testing is another interesting concept that I've added. It tries to capture the percentage of the population who has the coronavirus but was not able to be tested. For example, imagine someone who gets sick, but not sick enough to go to the hospital and no convenient testing facilities are available. These dials will allow our model to separate the reported infections from the actual infections in the US. The reported infections are the numbers that we see in the news and on the ECDC website. No one knows the actual infections, we can only estimate them. To see this difference, I'm going to plot the actual infected population I versus the reported infected population represented as reported underscore I. So right now we can see that both these curves are right on top of each other. As I change the testing percent and the percent asymptomatic, we're going to see some difference between the actual infected population and the reported infected population. Let's change historical testing to just 10%. And let's say change the percent asymptomatic to 40%. So now we can see quite a difference between what the model is predicting for the actual infected cases and what would be reported in the news. An important note is that when we apply the SIR model projection, we are applying it to the blue curve and the actual infected population. But we can see the results affecting the orange curve, which are the numbers which we can compare to those that we see in the news. In this naive example, we can see that the active reported infections started around 300,000 and go up to their peak in about 30 days. But this is without any social distancing, and I'm assuming we aren't getting any better about testing. But in this UI, I've made it so you can change certain assumptions through time. Here, I've chosen to allow the user to change social distancing through time and also the testing percentage through time. I don't have a great view of what these numbers should be, but we can see the effects of them on our model predictions as we make different assumptions. So let's add in some social distancing. Imagine we are perfect for about 20 days. So this means 100% effective for 20 days. So what do we see here? We see that the model is predicting a reduction in the number of infected cases through time to the point where we have zero infected cases after a certain amount. And this makes intuitive sense because we're basically perfectly socially distancing for longer than the recovery time of anyone who's infected. So with 100% social distancing, the virus effectively dif disappears from the population. But what if we were only 90% effective? 
This is a more realistic assumption, so let's check how our model predicts that. Here we see something a little bit more interesting. So our 90% effective social distancing works for a certain amount of time, but then we see a second wave that experts have been wor worrying about. Because the social distancing is only effective enough to bring down the cases but not eliminate them for society, as soon as we let up on our social distancing, we see a bounce back from the model. I'm not an epidemiologist, and this is just a little toy model, so we could envision lots of scenarios where our social distancing is reduced, but our hygiene and testing go up considerably, enough to keep a second wave in check. We could see this by perhaps reducing the R0 to 1.3 or 1.4. This simple analysis of the coronavirus won't ever make the news, and it pales in comparison to the heroes who are fighting each day on the front lines against this epidemic. However, the tools and technologies which can enable people to learn and discover on their own are important. The act of discovery and exploration by itself can be empowering in such a dark time. I and everyone at Beacon are wishing you and your family good health, and of course a speedy end to this crisis. Thanks for watching.